we have these guidelines, you know, 1.6 grams per kilogram for the athlete and the person really trying to optimize 1.2 to 1.6 grams for everyone else. But does where that protein's coming from affect strength, affect the building of muscle mass because of things like protein absorption and utilization differences between specifically between foods that contain animal protein and foods that contain plant protein. So where do you where do you begin in terms of looking at the evidence to help answer that question? Well, a lot of people will cite um, studies on again muscle protein synthesis as we sh- we've talked about. Some people will point out the amino acid profiles of different foods. I would go straight to the trials actually assessing, again, muscle and strength gains, because that's the topic at hand here. If it is the case that animal protein and plant protein result in the same muscle and strength gains, provided you're consuming the same amount, then who cares about all that other stuff? Now, for the sake of this discussion, we can definitely dive into that that information and, and kind of break it down further. But if we were to go straight to those randomized controlled trials to start here, we have two now, or sorry, clinical trials, because they were not randomized, and I'll get to that in a moment but two clinical trials um, that we have. So one of them was a Brazilian study done by Hamilton Rochelle and Heavy Lorraine and, and colleagues. And in this study, they had 19 vegans and 19 meat eaters. Now, the reason it wasn't randomized was because they wanted people who regularly consumed those diets. It's a bit more of a challenge if you were to take a regular meat eater and then place them on a vegan diet and have them match protein because they're trying new foods, they aren't used to these plant foods, how to prepare them, they might not know what seitan or or maybe haven't prepared tofu and all of that. So they had 19 of each. They had them up their protein to 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight, either exclusively from plants or mostly from animals. And they had them resistance training twice a week for 12 weeks. And then they measured the changes in strength and muscle gains from the beginning to the end, and there were no significant differences between groups. And so that suggests that both can support similar performance or or similar improvements. Now, following that, there was another study out of the UK by Montaigne and colleagues where they actually did randomize most people. Now, this is one nitpick I have for this study. I wish they would have excluded people that they didn't randomize. So they randomized most people to either a vegan or omnivorous diet, but they had one or two people who were already vegetarian or vegan. So they put them in that group rather than... And this one was men and women. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The first one was men. Um, So they had them uh, up their protein now aiming for two grams per kilogram, not because they think that that was necessary, but so that they have a buffer because they ended up consuming more like 1.8 or so. So still above that 1.6. They also had both groups consume creatine because that can also further bolster gains. And they had them training a lot more, this time five times a week for 10 weeks. And once again, no differences in muscle or strength gains. And one of the primary protein sources was mycoprotein. So this is a Mycelium is sort of a type of fungi that that's really high in protein um, and is sometimes uh, used in like meat alternatives. Um, and so those two trials show that actually there are no clear significant differences in muscle and strength gains as long as you're consuming the same amount of protein. And that's ultimately what matters. And we can get into the nitty gritty of, again, those other details I mentioned, but that's that's the end result. And just to give people a little bit of an overview of, I guess, the, his- the history coming into those papers. There, there have been, over the years, a bunch of studies that have compared an isolated animal protein to an isolated plant protein and then just looked at, at muscle protein synthesis in the, in the kind of post-meal period. And a lot of those studies did point to the animal protein being more anabolic. So I think, generally speaking, I'm not sure if you would agree with this, but at least from, from what I've read, the hypothesis going in from a lot of people was that the animal, the omnivorous diet where 60% of proteins coming from animal would probably lead to better muscle and strength outcomes. That would be the hypothesis from those acute MPS right, from studies. from those acute studies. Yeah. But those two studies came out. Plus, there's now studies looking at muscle protein synthesis, not only in the acute post-meal period, but daily muscle protein synthesis and the one that's coming to mind first here is a study from nicholas bird that you and i were were speaking about and the reason i want to go here first is that this came out this year and that was also healthy adults so that was a that was a kind of young adult population and the reason it's interesting is because there's two studies that you mentioned 
they were pretty high protein. Yeah. Like 1.6 and the other one was 2. Um, one of them was 1.6. One of them they were aiming for 2, but they ended up hitting about 1.8. Okay. 1.8. 1. But yeah. th those are really high. So yeah. some people might see those and say, okay, so maybe there's no difference between plant and animal when you jack up protein that high. You overcome the differences in like amino acid profiles. So then Nicholas Bird and his group, they they looked at a protein intake of 1.1 to 1.2 grams per kilogram. Again, that's more in line with just the general person. If you go and pluck someone, you know, out out of a, a random neighborhood in Los Angeles who's not tracking their protein, they probably land at 1.1, 1.2. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. And they were looking at not just this muscle protein synthesis signal straight after a meal, because We've over time we've realized that there are some issues with that, and maybe we want to double click on that. But looking at daily muscle protein synthesis, and they compared a, a vegan diet to an omnivorous diet. There was two different meal distributions. Yeah, so they had there was four groups. There was two omnivorous groups and two vegan groups, and then one of each had an unbalanced right. sort of meal schedules similar to what you might have in a standard diet where low protein breakfast moderate protein lunch high protein dinner and then they had the other groups um five meals 20 percent of protein at each meal so evenly distributed so they're they're kind of answering two questions a is there a difference between an omnivorous diet and a vegan diet when it comes to daily muscle protein synthesis at protein intakes which are just representative of normal people and then second, does the distribution of that protein matter? If it's if it again is in line with how people normally eat, where they're stacking protein at dinner, is that disadvantageous compared to like this even distribution that perhaps is a bit more of a bodybuilder style way of eating? And over that nine day study, measuring daily muscle protein synthesis and taking muscle biopsies, again, no significant no significant differences between the two groups. Between all four groups. Between all four Yeah, groups. between all four. And they also uh, were resistance training throughout that time. I don't know if, if you mentioned there, so that's important to note. Um, and what's actually interesting is if you look at the vegan groups compared to the omnivorous groups, they found that there was less uh, post-exercise fatigue and some interesting findings that way as well. So something to maybe further explore uh, down the road. I recently ran my full labs through Function Health. And I have to say the results were eye-opening. Turns out my ApoB was higher than ideal, probably thanks to a little too much coconut yogurt. I also found out I was slightly low in copper, something that I would have never suspected without testing. On the flip side, my biological age came back 13.3 years younger than my actual age, a calculation based on the work of aging researcher, Dr. Morgan Levine. So all in all, I've got a few tweaks to make to optimize my lipids and nutrient status, but overall my blood work says I'm doing pretty well. That's what I love about function. You get access to over 160 biomarkers covering everything from hormones and inflammation to nutrients, toxins, cardiovascular risk, and more. And all your results are housed in one beautiful platform, all tracked over time. Once you get your results, you can make informed changes before small issues become big ones. To get started, head to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. The first 1000 people get a $100 credit toward their membership. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.